Hola. Buenas tardes. Eh, déjenme empezar por aquí. Sean ustedes bienvenidos. El Museo de Memoria y Tolerancia, desde su concepción, intenta ser un espacio de puente, eh, de diálogo, un lugar eh, que pueda ser refugio, santuario, y que reconozca también eh, el severo comportamiento del ser humano al destruirse a sí mismo. Eh, ergo memoria, la memoria como una herramienta pedagógica, recordar para no olvidar, no olvidar para no repetir. Por otro lado, la parte de tolerancia comienza con el respeto, con la aceptación de las diferencias, con una coexistencia armónica que nos hace enriquecernos como seres humanos. Y en ese marco, el día de hoy eh, le doy la bienvenida al Instituto Gefe, a Stonewall 5.0, eh, y a nuestros compañeros que en un momento más eh, subirán a formar parte de la mesa. Esta eh, conmemoración, por así decirlo, quizá ustedes lo sepan, quizá no, es, tiene que ver con violencia ejercida contra una comunidad específica, la comunidad de la diversidad sexual, pero particularmente en Stonewall Inn contra una población marginada, dejada al margen, excluida. Y en el 69 sucede esto y la primera vez que hay una representación enorme eh, y se, se le llama en realidad la liberación de Christopher Street, es lo que conmemoramos como la primera marcha del orgullo gay. ¿no? Como si hubiéramos sido expulsados del closet eh, un poco con eh, violencia para reivindicar nuestros derechos afuera y ocupar los espacios públicos. Este museo quiere ser y es, y espero que así se mantenga para siempre un aliado, y en esa cuestión de alianzas también nos da gusto cada vez recibir y ampliar esa base con instituciones como el Instituto Goethe. Les doy a ustedes la más cordial bienvenida, les agradezco su tiempo y su energía por estar aquí y la palabra ahora queda a cargo del director del Instituto Goethe en México. Bienvenido. Muy buenas tardes. Desgraciadamente mi español es un poco pobre, entonces tengo que leer. Muy buenas tardes, shalom, good afternoon, bonjour, un tag. Muy estimado maestro Adán García, estimadas señoras y estimados señores. Me da mucho gusto saludarles el día de hoy y agradecerles su colaboración y presencia. Esta conferencia se realiza en el marco de un proyecto internacional que se llama Queer as German Folk. La idea de esta conferencia es el resultado de un discurso entre muchos intelectuales, artistas, personas de movimiento y colegas de los Goethe Institute en Canadá, Estados Unidos y acá en México. Agradezco el enorme apoyo de todos los involucrados acá en México, sobre todo al Museo Memoria y Tolerancia, que nos permite estar en este día de Shabbat que es un día sagrado en que los judíos normalmente no trabajan. Más aún, estoy agradecido que podemos estar aquí. Asimismo, agradezco el esfuerzo de nuestra central en Múnich y todos los aquí presentes en el presidio, que son Felipe Juniga como moderador. Un aplauso, por favor. <tose> Y Sayak Valencia de México, representa. Michelle Pearson Clark de Canadá. Joshua Allen de los Estados Unidos. Y algo raro. Un francés representante de Alemania, Jérôme Robinet de Berlín. La situación de la gente queer en los países aquí representados es muy diferente. Dejemos hablar esto en vista de que es justo el sábado que viene se le celebrará una vez más la marcha. Déjenme agradecer a unas personas sin las cuales 
no se hubiera podido realizar esta conferencia. Muchas gracias a Milly Cohen, vicepresidenta y fundadora del museo, a maestro Adán García, director académico del museo, y a ingeniero Iván Blanco, director operativo del Centro Educativo Trupe. Muchas gracias también a los presentes en el presidio, quienes en parte han recorrido largas distancias para poder estar acá con nosotros. Quiero agradecer a todo el equipo técnico de este recinto su empeño, a las intérpretes, así como a mi colega Sibylle Ellermann, quien organizó todo de parte de nosotros, y su compañero Itzel, muchas gracias. A nuestro técnico Rodrigo Márquez y a Marie Speckmann, algo, quienes se encargan de la gestión técnica. Agradezco a todos ustedes su presencia para hacer posible esta discusión internacional. Muchas gracias. Buenas tardes a todas y, y todos. Eh, pues yo me sumo a los agradecimientos, no, no voy a hacerlos tan extensos, solamente al equipo del museo, al equipo del instituto y a nuestras invitadas por estar el día de hoy aquí, por supuesto a todas, a todas ustedes por estar aquí. Eh, voy a hacer una muy breve eh, lectura de semblanzas para eh, que conozcan un poco la trayectoria de las participantes y después hablarles un poco de la estructura, bueno voy a primero hablar de la estructura un poco de la charla. Eh, pensamos hacerla um, primero una presentación individual para que ustedes puedan conocer las diferentes ramas de las que provienen las invitadas eh, y después vamos a hacer una sesión de preguntas donde estarán interactuando entre los participantes y después eh, les vamos a, vamos a abrir el espacio para las participaciones. Hay unas hojitas que vamos a estar repartiendo para las personas que quieran ir tomando nota, participar con alguna pregunta. Esto lo hacemos por razones de hacer más ágil el asunto de la traducción y también poder escoger preguntas que puedan estar como transversales a, a los participantes. Entonces, en cualquier momento eh, están dos personas en la sala con hojitas y y lápices para que esto pueda ir fluyendo y ustedes pueden ir entregando sus preguntas, ya las colectaré yo y haremos la sesión de preguntas y respuestas. Eh, y bueno, pues tenemos eh, Sayak Valencia, eh, ella es mexicana, es doctora en filosofía, teoría y criticismo y, y crítica en la, de la Universidad Complutense de Madrid, es... Eh, una investigadora y académica feminista en el Departamento de Estudios Culturales del Colegio de la Frontera Norte. Es eh, miembro del SNI en nivel 1. Eh, ella se ha desempeñado en México y Latinoamérica como poeta, ensayista y artista de performance. Ha dado conferencias eh, en alrededor de Europa, Estados Unidos y Latinoamérica. Eh, es autora del de, eh, libro Capitalismo Gore. Eh, traducido ahora al inglés, eh, y los temas de, eh, en los que ella está especializada son el capitalismo gore, el transfeminismo, el feminismo, los feminismos chicanos y poscoloniales, así como teoría queer y queer con, con C. Eh, Michelle, Michelle Pearson es una artista originaria de Trinidad y Tobago, nacida en Trinidad y Tobago, eh, es documentalista, fotógrafa y utiliza medios como la instalación, la práctica eh, del archivo y el performance son parte de sus medios de trabajo y eh, ella explora eh, temas personales y políticos considerando sobre todo el, el aspecto afectivo eh, vinculado con la pérdida y la añoranza. Eh, tiene un muy eh, amplio 
currículum de, exhibi de exhibiciones, en las últimas en el Museo de Bellas Artes en el, eh, de Montreal, eh, de arte contemporáneo, que se llama Here We Are Here, Black Canadian, en All That Is Left On Set, en Los Ángeles, Black Radical Imagination, en el Museo de Arte Contemporáneo de Chicago, entre otros. Ella vive y trabaja en Toronto. Eh, y bueno, vamos a dejarlo. Ha sido su trabajo eh, publicado eh, en diferentes eh, editoriales también y ha participado en el festivales de video alrededor de Norteamérica. Joshua Allen es artista, eh, organizadorix comunitario, comunitarix, escritorix y conferencisti, conferenciste en Nueva York. Eh, trabaja en la intersección entre el arte y el activismo desde, 19, desde 2014 y eh, trabaja también en, el, en la eh, promoción de derechos y problemas de la comunidad LGBTIQ, AP, eh, vinculado obviamente con eh, comunidades de color en los Estados Unidos. Eh, Jerome Robinet es francés, escritor, traductor y performer de Spoken Word. Ha publicado dos volúmenes de cuento corto en Francia, eh, que no voy a poder pronunciar. And Light is neither fair, not unfair. Y... My Way from a White Woman to a Young Immigrant Man, publicadas esta, eh, recientemente en 2019. Eh, y bueno, ahora sí, eh, vamos a hacer el panel, va a hablar en, en inglés y tendrán la traducción simultánea. So, um, one of my first eh, questions would be for you to introduce your practice, your art practice, but also linking with the notion of queer commons, since the main uh, theme of, of the conference is queer commons, queer um, conflicts. So how your, your practice is or not, or is linked to a sense of communality? And yeah, if you could talk a little bit about that. Whoever wants to start. <laughs> ¿Podría poner las fotos, por favor? Hola. Buenas tardes. Uh, lo siento, no habla español. <laughs> uh, my name is Michelle Person Clark. Um, I'm from Trinidad, but I've been living in Canada since 1992 when I emigrated with my mother and my sister. Um, and I have a master's in social work, so I actually worked as a health educator and social worker for 10 years before I went back to school um, at age 40 to do a master's in fine art. And so I've been working full-time as an artist since 2015. And I work in video and I work in photography. Um, and in all of my work, I am interested in experiences of grief and loss. Um, I think those are the most common human experiences, but certainly living in the Western context that I live in, those are also very stigmatized human emotions. And so, you know, when somebody says, how are you doing? You say, fine. We don't really say how we are feeling, right? We, we, when we leave the house, we are supposed to be positive and good and happy, and we're not supposed to talk about uh, the pains that we feel. Um, and if you are grieving, you know, it's a, you have a limited amount of time. If you lose somebody you love, it's like you go to funeral and then, you know, get back to work, get, get back out there into society. Um, and so with all of my work, I'm interested in making space for us to connect across those human emotions um, and also to provide, um, hopefully, opportunities for people to, um, to think also about the political aspects of what does, it mean, what does it mean for queer people to not just be, we are positive and we are just like everybody else, but that we also can just talk about the pains that we feel as a political action, because I think 
We deserve our full humanity even when we are depressed. We deserve our full humanity even when, you know, we are homesick or lonely or anything, any experience like that. Um, so that's what I would say about, to start. Okay, thank you. Hi, buenas, buenas tardes, gracias a Todex por la asistencia y eh, también por la invitación. Gracias a les colegas aquí por, por compartir. Voy a hablar en inglés, lo cual me parece un poquito extraño estando en México. Este, y voy a hablar en inglés chicano, que es lo que yo hablo, porque soy de allá del norte, entonces pues va a ser un inglés así, ya saben cómo. Eh, <laughs> así como Spanglish. But uh, actually, well, for me it's really important to say that uh, I am uh, part of the activists and uh, artivists, maybe, but not exactly an artivist. I I came from the the yeah the academia, so but so I make performance also. But for me, it's a with my performances, I want to put some questions in the space and and make it uh, like visible. The binary it's not that that strong that. He, he said that the, the binary is really strong, but for me it's like a, if you are like a, making a small small uh, stuff, you can crack it. So it's a, for me it's really it's about to uh, put in the space some questions that we have at all. But also, um, I am a trans feminist activist, and it means like the queer, like see, it's like. Uh, queer for me, it's not uh, that relevant if it's without feminism. For me, my point of uh, uh, struggle is feminism because misogynist uh, way of acting of this society making uh, are killing us. Like not just because to be queer, but this because to be feminine or uh, visualized like feminist, feminine. So like feminicide, uh, femicide also uh, LGBT. Who, uh, phobia, but also apodophobia, who mean who, what it means like uh, hate the po impoverished people or be anti immigrant and then all other uh, intersections that make us like really vulnerable. For me, it's uh, really important to say that uh, in, spi in the Spanish context, queer, that with, cu with Q U E E R, it becomes queer. Queer, like uh, when we are speaking with accent to this world, but also it's a trans feminist perspective. What it, what it means uh, for me to be a trans feminist artist or scholar, it means that uh, we have to make alliance, uh, 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 yeah, alliance between uh, not just sexual dissidents, but also about class, also. Migra uh, migrant sta status and also um, gender, of course, but also también the race and other stuff that make all, make it all uh, of us really vulnerable. So trans feminist for us is like to be with uh, trans people also and inspire by trans people, but it means also that trans is a prefix that means mobility and something that's change all the time. So for me and for the trans feminist movement that it's really different between the, 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 the different countries that we are trying to make it sense, but with the, also with a Spanish language to make an epistemology of the resistance and make it queer in the queer, you know, and also uh, for me, it's uh, the common thing for us, it's have to be a, uh, to have the memory of the movements, but also like like the Stonewall, uh, as they said uh, at the beginning of this conversation, uh, it's not about the uh, United States, New York, uh, 1969. Uh, it's like uh, about uh, that people just start that uh, riot, but it was uh, transgender people, color people, poor people, and. Uh, person with uh, was surviving in that uh, in that condition so it's not really different uh, our conditions right now from those days and we have to think about it and make the communality not just because we are really cool persons and want to be this good queer people 
we are trying to, or I'm trying to uh, make it, it, it makes sense for many of us, not just because I'm gay or queer or lesbian, but for the most, uh, for the majority of us who are not queer because we fuck with other, the same sex uh, persons because we are queer because uh, the context in, in which we are living right now, it's uh, making us vulnerable for all of, uh, and many points. So I will just finish here and, uh, you know, it's a, uh, voy a hacer un chiste, pero ni en inglés puedo parar, eh? ni en inglés, ni, ni, habla, ni, ni sabiendo no hablar el idioma, yo hablo, hablo, hablo. Entonces, ya. Yeah. Hola a todos. Buenas tardes y muchas gracias por, por su presencia hoy. Um, I want to begin by saying thank you to Felipe, to my co-panelists today and the institute who invited us. Um, it's an honor for me to be here and share more about my work. And I'm really grateful to you all for coming out. Um, you could be anywhere on a Saturday afternoon, but you've decided to be here. And that means a lot to me. So thank you all as well. Um, so I'll be brief in my introductions. I'm super excited about the conversation we're going to all have today. But I want to share a little bit more about myself, my story of coming into activism and artwork, and um, I guess where I'm located in this queer movement that we're going to speak about today. So my name is Joshua Allen. I'm from Brooklyn, New York. Um, um, in New York City, uh, the, the site of the Stonewall Riots in 1969. Um, this year, we're on the 50th anniversary of those Stonewall Riots. And I guess maybe a good point to start off is by what you just said. Um, many of the conditions in my hometown that led to those Stonewall riots were conditions that we're still faced with today. Issues of um, misogyny, of racism, of transphobia, and poverty. And so maybe a little bit of more of the context of, um, of the neighborhood that it took place in, many of the, the people, trans people, drag queens, young people of color in New York City where I'm from um, are, are homeless. In New York City, the largest um, homeless population is LGBTQ young people. And so back in the 1960s, um, the, the many people, they, they lived in public space, right? When you're kicked out of your home where you live with your parents or you're too poor to afford one of your own or you're too young to start working yet, many people went to the piers or the public parks or access public space as a way to survive and to get by. And so many of these people who inhabited these neighborhoods um, were often targets of the police, of the state, and otherwise people in our community who had a problem with people expressing themselves along lines of, of gender and sexuality that were not normative. Um, but but I, I, I think it's important that the conversation around Stonewall and LGBTQ issues is not relegated to just gender and sexuality, like you said earlier. I think the issues of racism and misogyny um, and classism are, are, are steeped in this history that we're here to talk about today. Um, and many of those issues still exist in my hometown today and I'm sure exist here and in our respective communities as well. And so, um, I got, I'm 23 years old, so I'm super young, um, but... <laughs> I got started in activism in 2014. Um, is anyone here familiar with the Black Lives Matter movement yeah. in the United States? Um, and so in, in my hometown, once again, New York's such a wonderful place. We have all these awful things happening all the time. And <laughs> in 2014, Eric Garner, a, a middle-aged man who lived in Staten Island, maybe like 40 minutes drive from where I grew up, um, was killed by the police. There were like five police officers who kind of like held him down and choked him to death. Um, and it was all caught on film. And so in my hometown, it kind of sparked a, a, a moment that grew into a movement for all of us. Um, because when you see that kind of injustice so visibly in your face, you kind of begin to think like, that could happen to me, you know? Like that guy could have easily been me or anyone that I knew or anyone in my community. And I decided at that point to take action. And um, within the larger Black Lives Matter movement, we spoke a lot about issues of class and a lot about issues of race. Um, but I was very disappointed that issues that LGBTQI communities faced were oftentimes erased. Like, I, I, I thought to myself, like, aren't I black too, right? Like, aren't I a part of this movement and shouldn't I have a voice and visibility here? Um, and also the issues of police violence and poverty that you all want to talk about are issues that do affect our queer and trans communities. 
And so um, from, from that year on out after joining the movement, I decided that I'd make it my personal goal and mission to expand the conversation, um, especially in people of color communities around LGBTQI issues, to find the commonalities that we live in our everyday lives and to build strong and powerful coalitions across our identities to make a safer world for all of us. And so now I work in the city as a columnist for Afropunk. I write about different issues affecting my respective communities. Um, I create art. Um, I'm super excited for us to talk more about art later on today. I direct and produce photo series. Um, maybe uh, one that I'll mention, I just did a photo project earlier this year called Sex Dreams, where I went around the country interviewing different young queer and trans people about their experiences about sex and how they feel about their bodies and their pleasure and desire, something that we don't have room to talk about that much. And um, I guess how this connects to activism is that I, I feel that so often we're, we're forced into boxes and binaries, right? And I think that we're all pretty, we all live in that same world where we're forced into the binaries. Um, but I think that the binaries don't afford us any space to be human, like you said, to grieve, to be small, to be vulnerable, to be insecure. And when we don't have that space, we don't have the space to grow. And so my work as an artist seeks to grapple with that. Um, and so, yeah, that's a little bit more about me. Thank you. Hola, México. Pues yo también estoy muy contento de estar aquí. La primera vez en México para mí, con un jet lag así de grande, así, tan grande como México a lo mejor. Um, y muchas gracias a todos, a todos por la invitación al Goethe Institute, al museo y a una otra institución que también está vinculado con el este acontecimiento, pero no me acuerdo. ¿Sí? Schwule Museum Berlin, tatsächlich, al Museo Gay de Berlin. Well, I am Jérôme Robinet. I'm, come from, I'm coming actually from Berlin, uh, but I was born in France and living in Berlin since 20 years. A little bit like Sayak said, um, well, actually, a lot of what you said, I could totally, agree, I, I totally agree with. Now, first, beginning with the language, <laughs> it's going to be a challenge for me. But the good thing for you and for the interpreter, I'm going to speak slowly. <laughs> Isn't it a good thing? <laughs> And as well, I'm trying to have a perfect accent, but I fail, totally fail. But the thing is, I just realized, sometimes when a person speaks in a foreign language with an accent, people think that the person thinks with an accent too. So I'm just really trying to make it right. Okay. Um, my artistic practice. Um, I'm a writer, so I come from the language, come from literature at the beginning, like uh, the person at home with a cat writing alone, that's me. And um, at some point I began to make spoken word. Maybe you know spoken word or poetry slam? It's just being on stage, having a few minutes to just deliver a message, to write, to, to, te to read a text, or just to improvise, or to read poetry. And um, yes, for me it was very important at that time. I began before transitioning. Yes, actually that's something I, I could say. I'm a transgender guy. It doesn't matter, but I say it. Um, sometimes I say I'm a man with a variation background. So. Um, yes, it was important for me at that time to be visible, like to be visible with another body, with other stories that people don't get to hear a lot. Um, and it can be in front of an audience that has nothing to do with the topic and that is going to be confronted maybe for the first time with the topic of being transgender, being queer, and as you say, like being queer in a broader sense, it's like, I loved what you say, it's like queer is not who I fuck with, but it's what I do in my free time. So it's, it's how I relate to the world and how I politically want to be in this world and moving around and be, being positioned in my, yeah. So, spoken word. Um, then I had a master in creative writing. So I began to give uh, classes 
to teach creative writing. For me, it's something that has as well to do with activism. Um, because first, I think when you teach something that can empower people, you are doing a kind of political work. And when I do that with a specific uh, target group, like a specific audience, I can see like how people are blossoming and telling stories about themselves that they maybe would never have thought that, that they could share. Um, and as well, when you link that with spoken word, which is movement, which is body, which is when you think that words can wound, so if you link um, a physical and a linguistic vocabularies, then in return, I think that words can heal. And with the movement, anyway, we can't have writer's block. So it's something that I, I'm, okay, yes, I, I'm, I'm doing a PhD research on the topic of empowerment of queer people with spoken word, with performance poetry. And I think movement is a, a big part of it. Yes, that's it for now. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I wanted to continue now. Um, first, uh, trying to say that uh, all of you kind of like navigate between uh, storytelling, uh, documentary, um, which creates a a big challenge for uh, representing and making visible stories that can alter or transform history. So I would like you to extend a little bit more about the relationship between narration or storytelling in the micro scale of the, of the story to try to then, uh, I don't know if that's something as a challenge that you're looking for or what would be the relationship with history and like storytelling stories. How would you, uh, specifically because all of you, I think work within the uh, media of, of language, either written or through performance or through documentary. Storytelling, I think it's a very, very um, important part of, of the practice. So how would storytelling mm -hmm. and the notion of the story and history, it's important and, and what, what are the challenges when thinking on queer communities of, very, of various uh, kinds and uh, also intersections with race and uh, class and, yeah. Points. Whoops, I, just I can do another one. <laughs> um, I think that History, history is just a series of stories, you know? We get taught um, in school and through textbooks that history is sort of just objective, factual record, but it's just a story, you know? Um, and for me, so many power, is inter power intersects so strongly with how the story is told, whose version gets recorded down as what happened. And so as an artist, I work almost exclusively with multiple people in my work to bring forth um, other stories, other histories that get recorded in my work, that get exposed to an audience in a gallery. Um, and those intersections of race and class so shape everybody's experience of the world and obviously will shape what stories people have to tell. But the other thing I really think about in my work, um, I think about archives and history a lot. And history records what happened, how it happened, where it happened. But it very rarely records how the people felt. So when I think about grief and loss and emotional experiences, I'm also thinking about in my work, how do I archive what queer people are feeling? Because as cultural, social, legal changes happen, they drastically change what it is to be queer. And the way, like the way that we feel about the closet is a good example. So, you know, 50 years ago, to be in the closet was seen as a successful management of being queer. 
people who were outed or people who chose to be out of the closet were seen as flawed. Like you failed somehow to manage passing. But that has completely flipped. So now we see to be out of the closet to be the healthy, self-actualized, positive way of being queer. And people who are closeted, we see as somehow, um, you know, trapped or lesser than or not living their full life. And there's a judgment that goes with being in the closet. And so I think it's important for us to document not just what happened and where it happened, but how did we feel? How do we tell stories about how we feel about what is happening and how we are experiencing things? So that, that helps the generations after make sense of their own emotional experiences because we get so many messages from the dominant culture about our emotions and so much repression around what we feel. And that's what I try to focus on in terms of my storytelling. Thank you for that. Um, I, was, I was thinking, you sent the questions a little bit earlier, and I was, um, I was thinking, oh, maybe this is something I'll sit out on, but um, your answer just inspired me. Um, when I think about storytelling, and particularly the, the need for more visibility in queer communities, I think that I want to tell more stories that are boring. Seriously. Like, I want to tell more stories that we've heard a thousand times before. I want to tell the stories that feel kind of played out. Because what has happened historically is that we've basically heard everything under the sun, but just not from a queer perspective, or just not from a trans perspective. And if you look at the world around us, I mean, really, art, entertainment, science, education, academia, the contributions of LGBTQI people across the world, it's, it's a multi-billion dollar industry. Our contributions to the world has, has made so much money and so much power and so much access for other people to now sit on top of. And so now as I'm working as a columnist or as I'm creating different art projects, I think to myself, how can I, how can I, how can I identify the people whose stories are not able to be told as easily? I just worked with someone who can't read or write for my column and, and sat down and interviewed with them. And I thought, wow, you have such a powerful story, right? But you're, you're, in many ways, you're just the same as I am or like you are, right? We share so much in common, but because of points of identity, points of access, right? Points of, of access such as literacy or uh, physical ability or linguistic ability, can cause our stories not to be told. And so as a storyteller, I'm more interested in figuring out how we can exhume those stories that maybe have been told before, but from a different perspective. Because I think it's so important. And also I, I think that when, when we don't allow queer and trans people to tell our own stories, we, we allow the rest of the world to profit off of the brilliance that we share, right? And so because of that, it's really important to me to, to make space and opportunity for other non-binary people, black people, young people, people who can't read or write to, to have a platform. And for me, I think that there is a, a sense of justice in that. Um, that doesn't need to be all about telling the most new, cool, cutting edge queer stories, right? I think that we as queer and trans people should be allowed to be boring as well. Well, for me, uh, well, if uh, you know my work, it's uh, all about, I'm a historian, uh, histories, like, yeah, historian, but uh, I'm really obsessed with history, and it's why, because when I was young, like a little child, uh, they told me all the time it was like that, always like that, and I say, when is always? All the time I just ask, when is always? Because if we just went to the history, or yeah, the history, Western history, uh, and you said, uh, and you find uh, the precise uh, time to, that it produced uh, some political fictions like gender, like heterosexuality, like uh, race, this, all these categories that we, uh, yeah, uh, linked with uh, identities that has been produced before and it's, it have, uh, it's related in our cases in Mexico and other countries, it are related with colonialism and what it means colonialism so to us. For me, it's really important to go to the, uh, go to the history and say when, when it starts and if when it, you know when it starts and way in why that benefit uh, that uh, colonial discourses and we are just 
repeating and repeating and repeating once and over and again. So we make a kind of epistemology of the oppressor and the oppression and make uh, and repeated that epistemology. And for me, it's really important because uh, story or yeah, storytelling. It's uh, for me. It's about the the, the possibility in the literature way of thinking that that we have like a, has a subaltern subjects or has colonized a person, but because they, they don't, yeah, they don't allow us to think in the, in the other ways of the Western rationality. So when we make these uh, interventions with storytelling or, uh, you know, literature or Whatever uh, photograph or other other formats to make this intervention and decolonize the perspective, it's really important for us because we are finally uh, know, knowing what it uh, what is what the what's the political way and the political benefit of this discourse. And for me, like uh, gender and race are really really uh, necropolitics, uh, uh, yeah, technologies that when they make us women or they make us blacks, not because we don't have a, like a biological uh, shape or somateca, but also because we just became subalternized and then we reproduce that. And for me, it's an, in, my, in my, actually I, I have a really not, really unknown uh, novel. It's about a trans, gender detective uh, from woman to man. And it's about the uh, feeling and, and it's about uh, many mysteries and many things, but also it's about uh, why we can't uh, just reconstruct this his the, the history and put it some just interventions. And for me, it's about that. And if you have uh, the possibility to make literature, and, and I go back over and over again to this argument because uh, in Latin America we have uh, extraordinary writers, you know, it is, it's, uh, yeah, there is a lot of good writers and uh, literature uh, movements, but we don't have philosophers or thinkers or whatever we have, no? We have it, uh, but we don't just fight to be recognized like that. So for me, it's, uh, it's not about to fight against the, Western rationality to be able to be recognized like a philosopher. It's about the, the possibility of the political imagination that it, you can do it, uh, you can make it another kind of rationality with literature. And for us, many, many times, many people just can be alive because write literature, not politic, but it's also, it's linked. And I think it's a certifuge to, put some discourse in other languages and other possibilities and to inspire other people and make revolutions and make, make riots and make, uh, you know, like fighting back and talking back. I think it's a, that's why I uh, really interesting to make uh, uh, questions to history. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. For me as well, storytelling is not so much or as, of course, as well, but not only talking about myself, but about, uh, through my story, talking about the society I'm living in. Um, for instance, I, my last book, is, uh, I loved your translation. <laughs> How I went from a, being a white woman to a young migrant boy. Um, when I began to um, think about writing a so-called memoir, I, actually it's auto-fiction, so it's a mix of autobiography and fiction. I read a lot of trans memoirs. I wanted to see what has been done and how I can position myself within that history of, of, of genre and what it means as well that um, we expect from trans people to write memoirs. Because trans people don't write literature, they don't write fiction. No? So I started with the, um, the, 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 um, from Christine Jorgensen in 1960, 62, um, until today. And then I've, I've seen like, um, 
both a continuity and a shift, and I was really amazed about that. And as, like you said, what is the kind of archive we can see about this, um, these histories, these stories that have been told, the archive of a social and a political changes. If you see at the big, in the 60s, most of the trans memoirs were focused on the suffering of the person and the person alone without, re without really reflection on gender roles and what the society is expecting from us, from us and from going to A, from A to B, like in that binary perception of genders. Um, and yes, this, um, I am alone and I have to fight alone and without access to any resources, no internet at that time, nothing, no community, difficulty to have access to hormone therapy, to surgeries, etc. So then, and then in the 80s, uh, beginning a shift with Kate Bornstein with the first time that it is, gender doesn't have to be a binary. Gender is a spectrum, you can be whatever you want. Um, and until now, like with uh, Janet Mock or Jameson Green, where it's more seen as an intersectional perspective of, of, um, of a human being and, and the intertwined um, categories we are living in, like the race, the gender, the class, the ability. And this Janet Mock and Jameson Green are not this um, person like, I'm fighting a uh, alone for my just to have the right to transition, but I am thinking of myself within a societal system. So and I was really happy to see that, um, that evolution. So for me, I wanted to make my memoir, like it, it was a kind of a, a joke actually to make a memoir. And I, <laughs> I thought exactly like a trans person, we need to change physically in order to be read as we are, and my, my book has to be called a memoir so people accept a transgender story. And, but actually I realized, even if it's difficult to, to believe I'm white, no, no, I am white, it's a fact, but in Germany I pass as a person of color. So it's, it was interesting for me to not only reflect this passing, suddenly passing as a man, and the experiences I had before and suddenly everything's changed because the, all the codes are different and what people expect from me. But this shift of passing from white to non-white slash how important the context is for some categories. So yes, actually it's not so much about my transition, it's more about like, mm, the society, like the, the, the gender roles and the racia, racia, la racialisation, racialisation. <laughs> Punct. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I now would like to take the conversation to the connection between, um, well, all the, the richness you already point out through your practices and how important, important is either to do the, the affective realm visible or either to count um, daily life stories that might not sound uh, revolutionary, but they basically um, create the fabric within then queer people we live. No? And then in an interesting way, it creates a communality uh, within the exceptionality that we are, we produce as exception by others, but by finding or making visible all, this, all these narrations, then we emerge not as uh, strangers or out of norm, but we are actually embedded in culture and uh, in our hometowns and within our families and our loved ones. I would like you to, if you can just share a little bit the relationship between that and the, the, the sense of justice, could be social justice or like legal justice, how would you connect this uh, relation between history, stories, and justice, the, the notion of justice? <laughs> I feel terrible every time I, I give you a question, I'm sorry. Yeah, <laughs> I, I will start to question about the notion of justice. Justice for whom? Yeah, 
because uh, in this country and many other countries, not just Mexico, no, but uh, uh, justice is not the same that law. Mm -hmm. And also uh, in this country, 99% of the criminal acts never get solved. So for justice for whom? Because if you are a wealthy and heteronormative person, and uh, not white, because in Mexico there is no white people, even if you have uh, 20 German uh, last names, because in Mexico it's Mexico, it's not like a, you know, white is, it's not the, the vector of, of the racial classification in, in this country, we are color. And also, uh, I will, I just promised myself that I, I don't be in this point to try to make in this difficult translation of myself, but I have to, and I don't, I don't know if, even if I, I can do it. But um, the justice is about that when you are a human, human being, and with our colonial uh, history, we never came became too human. You, human, not just a uh, species. It's about a frame of lecture, a frame of talking about like uh, you are uh, respect and uh, consider person. Like uh, they don't talk with us. They govern us, but they don't talk with us. And for me, in this really necropolitic uh, way of uh, yeah, necropolitic system of governmentality, it's really difficult to be a human being. And I, I just make fun of this, but it's not funny. In, in, or, and it's not funny when it happens to you, obviously. And it's about, uh, we all the time want to get into the modernity, like, you know, but we will, but it will be in a coffin. And it's that it's happened with, with us right now. And it's like, uh, I, am, I am here because I have many privileges, because I'm educated, because many people read me like a white person, but I'm not more yellow, maybe. But uh, it's, um, it's about that I'm a, a professor, so I can speak uh, here, but uh, I'm not speaking for everyone because it's, it's impossible, but it's a, it's a, um, really difficult to relate justice with uh, other stuff. It's the same with the uh, human uh, rights. It's like a really difficult uh, discussion, and, uh, but it's my perspective. Many, there is a lot of other perspective. For, for, uh, for me, it's, uh, it's about uh, how we can, can be together to make ally, uh, alliances for survive, many people depends that we make common to make uh, have the possibility to survive for other people, not just for ourselves, because neoliberalism makes us like individuals and destroy the communities. And for me, it's really inspiring the, 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 the possibility to make a community, maybe a really precarious community, but the, the commu community is the only way that we can just get through or other stuff, not just because the rights or the justice or the law, it's because you need to care about others and be cared for others so we can just survive because of that and not just an, an uh, you know, really nation state uh, agreement, it's, uh, it's about other stuff and for me that is queer. Queer is to survive and to be in alliance with others and that's it. Yeah, maybe other persons thinks other things, but that is my, my answer. Yes, I would jump on that concept of justice um, totally. Like, it's always the question is uh, for whom? Um, and even in uh, regard to law, law doesn't apply the same to everybody. Like, if you say, like, even in, um, okay, Germany thinks it's, it, it is in, in, um, in many uh, regards, a progressive country with some progressive laws. Um, if you think about uh, the new approved um, marriage for all, marriage for everybody, um, since uh, two years now. <clears throat> Actually, it's not for everybody. For instance, um, intersex people, are not 
um, concerned are not um, um, are excluded from that law because the law says it's for the same sex or for the uh, uh, different sex and the same man and women. In Germany, um, um, fortunately, I think the word doesn't exist, but let's create it. <laughs> fortunately, um, there is a third gender option. <clears throat> so people can be uh, officially registered as diverse and or with a blank gender option. This means that those people actually cannot marry. Even worse, intersex people are often subjected to um, genital mutation at birth because um, most of people think there are just only two sexes and two genders. So they try to make those bodies fit, fit into that binary. And this is actually a human rights violation and a lot of organizations um, are calling governments up those mutilations and the governments continue even like in February the European Parliament called on every EU state to stop and the and it's continuing so I think this really like the bodily integrity and the self-determination should apply for everybody not like this or oh, we are in a country with justice so but actually that was not your question <laughs> was it no. <laughs> no. <laughs> Actually, uh, I want to add something. Um, yeah. It's not that just about justice, it's, it's about whom, yeah, but also I'm not saying that we have to uh, deconstruct the, every uh, law system to, uh, uh, for instance, I, I just want to many people have rights, not at, at the opposite, you, you know, because it's, it's strategy. It's a strategy for uh, make it uh, possible the surviving of many people. No, it's not just because there is no justice for everyone. There, there will not justice at all. Just I'm saying this because sometimes we have many like a fate, like fate, not, not fate in the in the totally sense with fate that the state came and saved us and they kill us. They can save us, but yeah. And for other, in other way, I just want to say that uh, in this precisely moment, and we are talking about uh, queer here, but uh, it's uh, also the social responsibility that we have, like a queer community, really di the diverse community, about uh, what is happening with the backlash and the uh, the reemerging of fascism. We live in uh, democracias fascisticas, like a fascist democracies, and uh, it, what it means, it means like a, we are living in democracies right right now, like with this, the faces, but we are getting killed because race, because gender, because, uh, yes, ma migrant status. So we have to be together to be like a, like a con counter discourse, but also a body, a, together but uh, to make a, a to ask for accountability of what is happening in the border in the south of the, this country and the north of this country like a, because we are queer but also we are people that have to survive and it, there is a like a negro or negro administrative uh, uh, ways of uh, trying uh, to exterminate some people. And I, I, I want to remember that in the last uh, few months that a lot of trans women has died in the, concentra uh, the concentration camps in the, in the border of the United States of Mexico, in Mexico. So why uh, we are just talking, we have to take uh, some position about it. And as a queer community, we have to, yeah, ask for accountability of that and make it uh, a reflection, a general reflection about how it just reemerged the fascism and its link with democracies right now. For not for everyone, but just select the who is killable and who are getting alive. Yeah. Totally. And if I can add something, uh, some uh, um, okay. I don't know how to <laughs> to begin. Um, Sometimes I think as well we need to be 
cautious about how we express solidarity and or how we do alliances because very quick it can become for um, um, above all when when there is a, a, a difference in the power dynamic it can be very paternalistic and or it can be uh, instrumentalized in a racist way um, like and sometimes, yeah, sometimes I, 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 I well, I, I remember once I was in, uh, in, in Egypt and I had uh, police violence there as a trans person at the airport. And I decided not to talk about it publicly because I thought I was sure that in, in Germany it would have been weaponized and to, 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 to stigmatize um, North Africa and or the, the Arab and, and or Muslim population in Germany, saying yet they are backwards. And I didn't want that. But then afterwards, I was talking with Egyptian activists who said, but if, if every left people, lefties in, in, in Europe, don't want to take a stand because they are afraid of racism, then how can you, you support us and our movement? So it was like a balance act between being making an alliances without the risk of of fueling racism and you know what i mean yeah of course and also the responsibility is not to came to the country to save someone it's about to what you can do in germany with the uh, asylum seekers and what are you can do with uh, queer communities, multicultural communities in that, in that place and listen to them and learn about them and just share with them and, you know, because it's not, it, it doesn't work the same thing here that right there or United States or Canada, Canada or queer color uh, communities. So it's, uh, everything is was like, like situated, yeah. Yes, exactly. Well. I'll do this, but I'll return to the trail of, of the questions and then open for, for the public, for the audience. Um, yeah, that you started pointing out uh, the, the global migration phenomena. So I think uh, I wanted to just bring justice to the table so it can, uh, we could connect the practice, the cultural practice that it's grounded in specific media and then how can either put intention on or trouble certain official versions of, again, as you said, gender, race, class, no? And justice through, well, whatever. You have law and the, the, what you're describing as the communality. But then I would like you to maybe extend a little bit what, what had happened now with, with the queer communality under this global migration phenomenon. What, what are your findings, your doubts, your, yeah. Okay, um, <clears throat> thank you for your offerings there. I agree with so much of what you just said. Um, and I, um, I wanna share that I was in Mexico City a few months ago, actually. Um, and when, uh, were you all familiar or aware when the, the caravan was coming through Mexico City? They stayed for about eight days in total. And so I came down with a couple of, uh-oh. <laughs> I came down with a couple of um, friends from back home. <clears throat> I, I have a lot of friends who have money in the United States. They have a lot of money there. And <laughs> I decided that I wanted to try to, you know, galvanize these girls who have money where I live to help support these people. Because um, the way that the, 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 I don't even want to call it the migration crisis, right? I, I think that migration is natural and it's happening all across the world. And in many ways, it doesn't have anything to do with the, 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 the necropolitics of the governments that rule the world around us. What it has more to do with is the, the, the structural challenges that we are facing in the world around us. For example, climate change, or for example, uh, narco states, right? That force people to be displaced from where they live to have to go somewhere else 
And so I felt um, uh, uh, personally compelled to um, support in whatever way I can. And I know that I'm, I'm relatively lucky to live where I live and to be connected in the communities that I'm connected in. And so I started a fundraising campaign to come down and basically my, my goal was to just help meet some of the basic needs of a lot of the migrants. I was aware that many people were like walking with like flip flops and sandals. And I, I could not imagine walking for hundreds of miles with sandals. You know, um, so I wanted to be able to help people buy sneakers or I knew people had the cold or flu to buy simple medicines and things like that. And so that's kind of what we started off doing. <clears throat> But then um, we picked up a lot of traction and got lots of support. People like Alexander Ruiz, who's here today, um, who's really involved in the community, thank you for your work, um, rallied around us and supported us. And we raised over $15,000 um, to be able to help. So we expanded from just the basic needs a conversation to being able to rent buses so the LGBTQ migrants who were really being left behind could make it safely to the border to present their cases for asylum. So I say this to say that the conversation about justice is really difficult to have when you are doing work, like I was doing right then, I came to try to raise money to help people meet their basic needs. But I also knew that many of the people who were coming as a part of the LGBTQ caravan were not gonna be granted access to asylum. They were not. And I knew that many people were gonna get sick along the journey, were gonna get deported here in Mexico and sent back. I knew that many people could be deported and sent back and possibly killed. They were fleeing for their lives. And I also knew that the conditions in the detention centers and the concentration camps where I live are, are so dismal and that people die there all the time. And that many of the stories that we hear that come out in the news, are that, that's just the surface of what's really going on, right? There are more people who are dying that we don't know about. There are people who are sick whose names we don't know. And so... I guess the, the issue of migration is really important to me because it, I think it shows that maybe we live in a world where there is no justice, where if people's last resort is to flee for their lives and we have to accept the reality that many people are gonna die in, in that same space, to me, that's not justice, it's not. But I do think it provides an important opportunity for us to build interracial coalitions to build coalitions across identity, across culture, across um, class. And I think that it, it offers us a space to enact an interpersonal sense of solidarity, really. I think as, as good as it, to me, I think it's gonna get. Um, because of some of the abysmal conditions that we're living in, and, and quite frankly, they're just getting worse, you know? What I learned from many of the migrants while I was here in Mexico City is that people are never gonna stop coming because the conditions are just that bad in countries like Honduras and Guatemala. And they're oftentimes being exhausted, the conditions are being exhausted by the governments that, that are ruling our, our countries to help gin up political fear in the United States where I'm from. And so, I'm excited for us to get into this conversation about migration, but I, I just think that it illuminates the, the idea that there's so little justice around us, but it does offer a space for us to be able to support and love and be there for each other in a way that it's not all about how you can get the rights, right? Or how, um, or about how everyone can be equal, because I don't think equality is gonna exist mm -hmm. on, on top of the structures that we've been building on top of. But I do think that we have a chance to interact with each other in solidarity that can be really beautiful and brave as well. Quiero aprovechar una pausa para si las preguntas tienen preguntas, comentarios, por favor poderlos ir eh, distribuyendo eh, por aquí por los lados. Eh, digo, perdón. If you want to continue. Um, I, I just wanted to add, uh, last, last year I did a project where I was spending time um, working with the public to learn and understand transformative justice. And I don't know if that's a concept that um, people are familiar with, but transformative justice asks us to think about justice in a, in, in a different kind of way. And justice is not about punishment, but justice is about accountability for the harm that you cause. And the reason I bring that up is because I think about um, the countries that have, through colonialism, through exploitation, through mining, you know, through capitalism, um, have caused damage in so many countries and now don't want to let people in, you know? And I'm like, I think it's important for those countries to be accountable for the historical harm that they've caused, you know? Um, and the borders that exist that 
constrain and confine people's lives. We didn't choose those borders, right? Like colonialism created all kinds of problematic borders that limit people, and now you're a migrant because you're moving back to where your people historically were. You know, like those those things are very loaded. Um, and from a Canadian context, talking about stories, one of Canada's greatest stories about itself is how progressive it is and how liberal it is. And that is not to minimize um, the legal and cultural and social changes that have happened in Canada around queer experiences. Um, and you may have seen our Prime Minister, you know, Trudeau, like on the news, welcoming Syrian refugees at the airport. And that is very much part of reinforcing the Canadian liberal notion that it is a place that welcomes everybody. Um, all Canadians know about the Underground Railroad, but most Canadians don't know that there was slavery in Canada because that is not part of the narrative of Canada as a place that you escape to. Canada is the place of freedom. But when those refugees come, they face racism, they face all kinds of other complex experiences. And Canada, it's, as I said, it's not to minimize the positives, but I think we also need to be realistic about the negatives. And, you know, the indigenous communities in Canada, you know, if you are an indigenous two-spirit person and you can get married as a queer person, but you don't have clean running water on your reservation, then that is an ongoing problem, you know? So it's a, it's a complex situation in terms, I mean, for all of us, but those are just some of the things I wanted to, to share about this idea of what justice is and that relationship to migration. Actually, um, I, I know that conversation was kind of morbid, <laughs> talking about there not being any justice, but I, I guess I do also want to share that um, there, there has been, from the caravan that I was supporting when I was here back in November, um, out of, gosh, we had like a group of uh, 103 when they got here. Not everyone made it. Some people turned away and some people were deported. Um, but, but out of the, the people who finally made it to the border, um, and this was back in November, early December, over 30 of them are now out of detention centers in the United States and living really fabulous and wonderful lives. People are connected with family there. People are, uh, multiple people have already been granted asylum, which is actually really difficult to do. Um, and what else? There's some of the uh, young lady named Estrellita is, um, is fundraising right now to start a, um, an organization called Casa Sin Fronteras, which is gonna be like a, a shelter that she hopes to begin for other young trans women who come to the United States to be able to kind of get on their feet when they come here. So in many ways, that, that to me is a form of justice, right? Um, so may, maybe it's something that, does, that all of us don't get to be included on, but I think it's beautiful and powerful all the same. So I wanted to illuminate that as well. It's not all morbid. I think there's a lot of beautiful and powerful work being done um, in this space of migration as well. And, and that just makes me think, too, one thing I want to add, this idea of not all things being morbid. I think the other thing that when we talk about um, queers leaving places to come to Canada or to go somewhere else, it also, I worry about the narrative of what does it mean for those who don't leave, you know, and that the only way to, to be safe, the only way to be... Um, to be able to live a full queer life is to go somewhere else. You know, like I, as I said, I'm from Trinidad and you know, there's a lot of narratives about homophobia in the Caribbean and, and, and again, people face real danger and people come claim asylum and come to Canada you know, for real reasons, but it doesn't mean that those who don't leave are not living full queer positive lives also. You know, that, that a queer experience is possible in many locations, even with, even with the violence. I mean, we face violence in Canada. You know, it's like those things are not mutually exclusive. So I just wanted to add that as well. Okay, well now we're gonna open up for the questions. Um, we'll see. One maybe that you could elaborate, all of you, it's um, what do you think about the pink capitalism uh, and corporations appropriating queer identities? Oh my God. <laughs> I swear, every year it just feels like it this year, I don't know, it just, you know, to actually today, this weekend is Pride in Toronto, so I'm a little homesick. But uh, I just, every year just grows, and this year it has felt so overwhelming. 
everywhere I look, there's a rainbow flag. Everywhere I look, there is some message about, you know, we love you, we celebrate you, and it's just, it's unreal. Like, it just has just, maybe if there's a graph, it would be like this in terms of the last five years and in my experience in Toronto. Um, and we now have, you know, a growing activist movement around creating alternative prides and creating other spaces because, you know, you look at the pride parade and it's like, I'm like, how many queer people are actually in this parade, you know? It's like bank employees and, you know, and also one of the things we've been challenging our um, Toronto Pride about is what what is the requirement for you to be in Pride Parade? Like, what are your policies? What are your business practices that you don't just get to come and be in our party if you are not actually doing the work as an organization in terms of your clients, your customers, your employees? Um, so I would say I, I really struggle with it. Um, I understand because we live in a capitalist society, the ways that capitalism, the ways that capitalism validates who we are, um, operates for certain people in certain ways as liberation. But for me, it's, I feel like we've, we've paid a high price and we've given up a lot for that validation. Oh, well, that is a really good question and, and uh, really necessary question. It's about, first of all, uh, Queer, it's not identity. It's against all identities because identities are related with national, uh, national uh, colonial discourse of nations and identification and classification to separate them, to separate persons and put them in boxes and everything. So identity is not just uh, uh, one thing, one di undimensional one. Yeah. Uh, it's about many complex and many things, but it's uh, identification is a good word for uh, make this uh, question more com uh, complex. And uh, the pink washing, it's about uh, just increasingly, enormously, as you said, uh, in Mexico City, there is a lot, even Uber have this, the new the trajectory of the, the taxi right now, it's like a gay pride, uh, Black, but it also there is a lot of uh, trans uh, and transphobia, LGBT phobia, and hate crimes, and also femicide crimes. So uh, for me, it's about uh, to have uh, really, really uh, to be really conscious about uh, aesthetics and politics have to be uh, related and together because uh, for me there is a lot of uh, trouble with uh, some, in some point of the recent history in the 70s, for example, when the movement, the just uh, LGBT movement emerged and uh, makes globally uh, rape indications and well, Stonewall uh, in that time, but not only Stonewall, other movements and before Stonewall and uh, before and after Stonewall. So uh, we have, uh, we lost a lot of when the rep representation became the only thing, uh, representation and representative is not the same. You know, like something is like uh, the cosmetic of the images of uh, what uh, identity means. Like uh, you have to look like, uh, I don't know how to be, right now I just look like a lady uh, woman, <laughs> but it's uh, not, if you see me that that is not queer because I need more like extravagance uh, outfit to be queer, but it's not because queer is a constant struggle against, uh, against vulnerability. And it's also, you're not queer because you put a mustache in a wig, and I did a lot because for the context it was important. But, but for me, it's not not to be like that, or I, I don't want to say nothing about that, what can do the people with their bodies, but also it's the queers, not just the wig and the, and the, the prosthetic of uh, representation. It's not just aesthetic, cosmetic, or prosthetic uh, issue, it's about a politic issue, and they are related. So you can put it, uh, you know, 
animal print, dress, and uh, but also that can they, that have to be related with some political position to make more livable the lives of the the person. So for me, it's that but pink washing is just the cosmetic com cosmetization of our identities, and they don't don't even are and identities with many quotes, you know, because or identifications, and uh, and they don't even are paying uh, anything to the communities. They are just exploding. Thank you. Well, here a question for Joshua. What are your thoughts on Joseph Beam and his work on the black gay movement in the U.S.? Yeah, I think Joseph Beam is great. Um, uh, if you all are not aware of Essex Hemphill, I think Essex Hemphill is great. I, I think they really offered, um, th these are just like for people who are not aware, um, there's like a, a series of maybe three or four um, really talented like black gay writers. Um, most of them are actually from the East Coast, which is where the part of the country that I live on. And I think their work was really prolific and actually quite relevant at this time because they were so unruly, right? Like they, they didn't really, I don't, wanna, I don't wanna start cursing and now like be unruly myself, but maybe they're empowering me to feel that way. Like they, they would talk about sex all the time, you know? And talk about doing drugs and talk about partying and just talk about, they were honest with their experiences in a way that I feel like this, this trajectory the LGBT movement is on, m m mostly because of the corporatization of, of, um, of, of our identities and our, our movements and our struggles and our history. Um, I, I think that we're, as a movement, we're deviating from that history that I come from um, towards this kind of more palatable, acceptable, normative version of queerness. And it's disappointing. And it's lonely, too, you know? Because I want to talk about sex and drugs and drinking and partying because those are part of my life, you know? And I think that when we deny ourselves that bit of humanity, we don't keep each other safe, right? We, we were speaking about the epidemic of HIV in this country earlier today at breakfast. And I mean, if, if we talked about sex more often, do you can you imagine what we could do about the issue of HIV? And so I really appreciated their work and everything they contributed. Um, and I wish they were still here today. I guess, well, we'll run in maybe a little late, maybe two more. So one for all the panel. Um, how does queer, and not here it's like queer and queer, has impacted trans feminism or trans identities? Do you think, and here it's more like queer with Q theory, has, well, what kind of impact ha has done on trans identities and trans feminism? Is that clear? Not really, more or less. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I think it's clear. Uh, before I, I answer, yeah. I wanted to say I'm so happy that I hear that we can be contradictory uh, because uh, I would love to hear very boring sex story. <laughs> like how it, we want to be more boring and more sex. <laughs> and we can, both is great. Um, as well, like about pink washing, I totally agree with that. It's, 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 set, it's set up in a system of capitalism. So with, within this capitalist society, it makes sense. And in a cognitive and intellectual way, I would reject that. Sometimes, but in an emotional or more, I don't know, way, I have to confess when I've seen that advertisement for Gillette, I think it is, with a trans guy and his, his father, yes, I was moved. And yes, so it's like... Yes, exactly, but we are rejecting binaries, so we can be both. <laughs> I, I, w I can only answer for the German context, and even not even for the German context, but for the Berliner context, or even not for the Berliner context, for my community context. Well, if we see, as you said, queer not as an identity, but more as a critical view on the production of identities, 
Then I would say the queer and this deconstruction of, binary, of binaries had led to, in my, in my sense, a more broader perspective on genders. So it's like, as I said before, we have seen a shift in the transgender community from, um, I have been born in the one body and now I want to become another body, another gender, to this, actually, if I decide that my body is male, it is male. I don't need surgery, I don't need hormones. So this more non-binary identities, I think that has have to do as well with the more queer perspectives. I'll just, I'll just briefly, I, I appreciate that. And I guess what I want to just add to it is that I, I think that in, well, where I'm from, there are tensions, to be quite honest, um, um, uh, amongst trans communities because I, I feel that the, um, the, the queering of transness has kind of uh, helped us deviate from a place of um, I'm transitioning from female to male or male to female, right? We're having more complicated conversations around gender that are not reinforcing the binary. And I think that many people, um, and it's totally legitimate as well, find comfort in the binary. Right, like we're allowed to be contradictions, and some people like they, some people don't want anything to do with queer. Seriously, like some some people who are trans, some of my own friends who are trans, don't want anything to do with queer communities or or queer issues because this is how they identify and how they're choosing to live their lives. And I think that all of us deserve the autonomy to to have that space. But I think it's as a non-binary person for me, it's really important that that there has been the queering of transness, right? And that we have queered the way that we even think about gender because I think it allows more space for us to be our authentic selves. And so I appreciate the queering of transness, um, but I just wanted to point out that nuance that, um, that it's quite complicated where I live as well. I just want to add, thank you, that actually for me, queer should and includes the possibility of binary, like of a binary identity. So it's actually, it's, it's, it should, include everything as, as well, binary identities. Okay, and this is, this will be the final? No? Uh, for me, it's, uh, as a trans feminist identified person, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a really good question because uh, it's not about queer theory, it's about queer movements and queer multitudes that inspire queer theory and became an institution and a way of thinking and an epistemology that it's really important that just became a hot topic in the 90s with Ethko uh, Susquiset, which with uh, Judith Butler or with uh, Teresa de Lauretis, who is the, the who said the queer multitude, the queer movement at the first time in the 99. 1991, I think, and but uh, for me, it's really important to understand, uh, and maybe you know it, but it's a, it's a queer, the queer movement was like uh, inspired, obviously, but also uh, with a political practice and a political practice that ca can go out to the streets and take the streets and make reivindications and was against AIDS, it was against uh, uh, Reaganomics and was against. Uh, the, the mentalization of the well uh, state, how you say the uh, welfare state, yeah, and it's a, it was like a lesbian, Chicano, feminist, Afro American, uh, lesbian uh, persons, uh, also H, HIV positive persons, and was like a mm, faggot and many people that crippled pe persons that, that I I think it's a, that that is the body that just in, incarnates that, that queer movement and queer multitude, and it means that multitude, it, it's really important this concept because multitude doesn't mean people, like pueblo, how you say pueblo, like uh, yeah, people. like people, but it's not the same in Spanish. Yeah. Population. Uh, Population, yeah, but it's, uh, it's okay. Yeah, I, I, I'm not getting that philosophical. Um, but it, multitude is a concept from Spinoza, who is a uh, really great uh, philosopher, a uh, Jewish philosopher, well, Sephardi philosopher. That it means that we don't have to be to like the same, like a, a 
population, like a country, like a nation, to be together and make uh, riots against the injustice and many things. But also the body that just make um, the materiality of queer that inspired the queer theory that just became into the academy in the 90s was those people, racial rights people and uh, precarious people and also people who speak with accent. And I love when you say that, that they think we think with accent, actually we do. Fortunately for us, and uh, it's um, it's that became to uh, in the academia and make it an epistemology, and it's really important because we are talking with th these grammars, but also I think uh, we have to recognize the 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 genealogy of the movement, and it was like more like it looks more like us, not that uh, really. Uh, universal and uh, westernized rationality that it's important and queer is not uh, f not just fabulous but we can be fabulous so queer can be the colonial but it's uh, if you have the critical position to think about this process of oppression it's not about a, it's not a choreography it's a, a factical way to deconstruct many things all the time in critical position. But th that's, uh, and that's it, it's the, the roots of trans feminist movement also. And we in the trans feminist movement want to, uh, we are really grateful to trans persons and trans women because it, they uh, make this uh, really revolutionary uh, movement but also with their bodies, not just because they are was like talking about it that they put it the body and many people put the body and it was really you know violent in the a really violent uh, uh, environments or you know for me it's really important that we don't, we can forget the body bo bodily experience is really important to make sense to this epistemologies and the trans feminism is the way that we are. So talking each other, but also making things together, not just thinking about it. Thank you. Again, well, I guess this is the last one. Um, well, it's actually for Sayak, but I think uh, everybody can yeah. take on this, or I mean, as much as they know, but how do you see uh, what's the, the, the common that share between uh, the camps in Auschwitz and the camp in the US Mexican border now. How do you, what would be the comparison that they have in common? So if we could name those as concentration camps. Well, I guess Joshua Tamir could answer that. Yeah, actually, uh, it's, it, it was other camps before that, it was plantation camps. And it, I think we have to think in colonialism if, one, if we want to think about the oppression, historic, historical oppression, and we have to get with, with, uh, with colonial uh, perspective eyes through the history, and it's not about just fascism. Fascism is the son of colonialism. And I maybe many other, uh, colleagues in the panel can uh, speak about it, but for me it's, a, it's not about just take the reference of the con Nazi concentration camps, it's about a plantation, other kind of uh, open space concentration camps, and maybe the, you want to talk about it. And for me it's a, let's go to name it, colonialism and open field concentration camps. But, yeah, I, I don't really feel comfortable making the um, the uh, 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 comparison with Auschwitz because I don't know, you know, I don't I don't really I'm I'm not aware um, of the the exact conditions, right? Um, and in many ways, many of the conditions of detention camps in the United States are not illuminated in the same way. You know, they're, they're, they still exist now, um, and they're still being created now. And so it's hard to make the comparison. But I can share with you what I know. Um, I know of this caravan most recently that I was just supporting, um, the majority of them are still actually in detention camps. Um, mostly they are placed um, around, around the border in places like New Mexico, Arizona, and Texas. Those are the three most populous uh, um, states for detention camps. 
Um, inside of the the camps, the um, it's extremely cold. That's what everyone tells me who stayed there before. They call them like the ice boxes. And so um, they basically uh, put you inside of different rooms or cells that are extremely, extremely cold. And it creates um, very life-threatening conditions for people who um, may enter in with pre-existing conditions. For example, um, one of the young ladies who just came with this caravan just passed away recently. Um, and she had HIV. And so it's unclear to me whether or not the detention, um, the, the, the officers knew that she had HIV, but she definitely was not getting medicine. And so I think it was the combination of her not receiving medicine and being in an extremely cold environment and being denied access to medical treatment. She would ask to go to the doctor and they would just say, okay, later, okay, later, and kept putting it off is what caused her to just die in that cell. Um, other conditions I think that are important to note is that uh, people are forced into solitary confinement all the time. Like many times, um, e e not just trans women, it's uh, gay men as well. Many gay men that I know um, in different um, detention centers out in California are um, when they experience an incidence of violence or an argument or are getting bullied or harassed, they're just, as a solution, they're put into solitary confinement, which is recognized as torture. It's, it's torture and, and, and that's their way of trying to keep people safe. Um, and then I, I also, I appreciate you bringing up the plantation, but I also think that it's important that we create a parallel with the, um, the system of mass incarceration and imprisonment that mm -hmm. exists in the United States right now. Yeah. Basically, um, many of these different detention centers are, are funded by private corporations. And so they have like these kind of weird traps. It's, it's actually quite difficult to describe, but where if, if you get in trouble, you can, be owed, you can owe a debt, right? Or you can come in and like, um, you could have presented and be applying for asylum. And if you get into a fight or an argument, or if you get an infraction with one of the officers, you go from someone who's applying for asylum and, and has never been in trouble before to now you have a criminal charge. So you, you're not gonna be eligible for asylum anymore. Or um, they have like, uh, we, we send a lot of money to commissary and like they take an obscene amount, they take 20% of the money that you give in commissary and they just take it and keep it for themselves, you know? Um, or many of the products that you would buy with commissary, like food or cigarettes or whatever, are extremely overpriced in comparison to what we would buy in everyday life. And so I, I, I think it's really important to create that parallel because what happens in prisons, not, not just detention centers, is that people get recycled through the same system over and over and over again because the very conditions of the place they're being kept the nature of it is to, to trap you and bring you back to it. Um, and, and I mean, I could talk about this all day. Those are just some of the things that I think are important to illuminate. The lack of access to medicine for people with uh, really serious conditions, um, really unsafe conditions of it being really cold. People don't really have blankets. Um, many of them are now overpopulated, so people don't even have beds. They're just sleeping on the floor. Um, uh, people don't have access to condoms. So you're inside of a detention center for, I don't know, six months, a year, a year and a half. Someone's having sex, but no one has condoms. And also there is a lot of uh, sexual violence against the, the, those persons. So it's really important that you are saying about the incarceration uh, system in the United States, because in Mexico it's different, but it, become, it, it will be really uh, close to those uh, models because the recent uh, um, agreements of my own migration that the the government government are making right now it will be everything seems like that the privatization of the prisons and also the Secretaría de Relaciones Exteriores and the INE que el el Instituto para la Migración del EMI perdón uh, it's a uh, it's like a va a ser dirigido it will be leader by uh, this uh, person who is uh, in charge with the uh, yeah, prison, prisons uh, stuff. So, you know, it's a, this is really important thing that we have to be in mind because everyone can be in those uh, conditions. And as you said, it's like a, uh, like a loop. You go out, but you, you because the person in the, in the and it's a color incarceration, you know, there's a lot of African, uh, Af uh, Afro-descendant person, but also Latino persons that just make one little thing, but they are inside and then make it this love over and over again. And for us, it's important because that will be the model for the incarceration in the next few years, I think so. 
Well, I guess I wouldn't like to finish here because it, it, it's a very tough ending. So I don't know if you want to just share a remark that could, I mean, we, we did this uh, very interesting uh, journey <laughs> and trying to connect art practices with, well, several things. Um, representation, storytelling, creating what we said, like this kind of like weave of, of, of stories, but also these weaving spaces for others to exist through the notion of commonality, but also um, solidar solidar solidaridad, solidaridad, solidarity. Um, and also examining at the, some of the conditions of what it's been, I mean, the contemporary conditions, but that they're not contemporary at all. I mean, they're present, but they're being sustained for very, very long periods of time. So maybe just to close with not a very gloomy, <laughs> <laughs> um, just something, I don't know, maybe you want to just insist like in the hard times, but maybe if there's anything you want to share. Um, I, for me, I, I draw strength from the history, I draw strength from the activism, I draw strength from the resilience. I know that so many queer trans people before me have made choices, lived lives, done work that have allowed me to live the life that I live today. And my job is to do the same thing so that the queers who come after me live, a, you know what I mean? It's like incremental shifts. Sometimes it feels overwhelming when we talk about all of these huge issues and these oppressions and these systems and they're real. But incremental shifts is what I aim for in my individual activism, in my artwork. If only one person sees one of my photographs and feels understood or more seen in the world, then I, that, that's it, I, I'm good, you know? It's like I, I just work to do those things. And I love, love being queer. Like, I love being queer. It has the, the possibilities of moving through the world that being queer has opened up for me. Um, I cherish it, um, and I hope you all feel the same way. Thank you. Yeah, okay. Yeah. It's a good, it was a good end, but I have the feeling I have to say. <laughs> uh, thank you. Um, basically, I would say something similar, like learn from the old days, like we don't have to reinvent the wheel every time. There's a lot of things that have been done that have been thought and discussed, and we can learn from older generation. So second, if you want to um, be an activist, take care of yourself. Take care of yourself not only because of the risks you may take on the road, but as well because it can be overwhelming, can be a lot of things. Sometimes I tend to, or I know a lot of people who tend to forget themselves. So just be kind with yourself. Be connected with the community. You can't do it by on your own. So the more... Take, take care of each other. Yes, I'm, I'm very exactly. skeptical of the rise of self-care. Um, you know, because there's no amount of tea and baths and bath. that are going to make racism feel better, you yeah. know? Yeah. Or so give a bath to someone else. <laughs> it's like, no, I, I agree. It's like you, you need to understand what you need and you need to take care of yourself, but we need each other. We have to take care of each other. We have to hold space for each other's complexities and failures and difficulties and just not give up on each other. Um, and you can't form community by yourself, right? You need other people to include you, other people to invite you, other people to hold space for you. So that's something I, I talk about all the time and try to practice in my own life is, is being there for other people and caring for other people. Yeah. Bueno, gracias. Eh, lo que quiero decir, bueno, igual lo voy a después tratar de decir en inglés, gracias por, por el tiempo, por la paciencia, por el interés, pero sobre todo lo que me parece más importante para cerrar es que no pensemos, que, que reconozcamos lo que ya pasó, lo, lo, todo lo que nos ha inspirado y por lo cual estamos hasta en este momento aquí, ¿no? todos los les 
personas que han hecho este trabajo hacia atrás y que los que vienen también, que son la mayoría de ustedes. Entonces, la, la conversación tiene que ser intergeneracional, que no se nos olvide que estamos aquí porque hemos logrado sobrevivir. Nadie nos regaló nada, ni nos lo van a regalar. Así que vamos a seguir haciendo alianzas para, con la gente mayor y con la gente más joven, porque sin, sin esta... Sin esa diálogo intergeneracional no sobrevivirá la memoria y entonces no sobrevivirán las prácticas de resistencia. Para mí sí es importante pensarnos como un cuerpo común conectado intergeneracionalmente. Enseñenles, enséñennos a hablar a los más jóvenes el nuevo código del queer ¿no? y también escuchen lo que las otras personas que vienen antes de ustedes tienen que decir porque las estrategias de supervivencia nos, nos van a mantener a salvo a la mayoría y a veces no son grandes tecnologías, solamente algunas son de cuidado, de cuidado comunitario, digamos, y otras pues de, de cosas que parecerían no, no sencillas o muy sencillas, pero que nos pueden ayudar a pensarnos de una manera distinta. Ay, a la gente joven que no se les olvide que el mundo material existe y que es muy importante, que es acá donde se hacen las cosas también. La parte virtual es importante, pero que no se nos olvide el cuerpo. And I will try to translate myself, so it's uh, really difficult, but uh, in the, uh, yeah, if I make a, just an abstract about what I said, is uh, we have to be uh, in the permanent dialogue with uh, last generations and the generation became uh, after and before us and we don't we don't have to forget that the the body and the materiality of the reality is uh, really important to make al alliances and also to retransmitting the the uh, yeah tools to uh, surviving in this context and also well i i love to be queer but because i like to i'd love to disobey <laughs> I love to disobey, and I, I don't know how it could be. Uh, maybe not, it's not about uh, just uh, gender or sexual uh, dissidence, but also I, I enjoy it a lot, and I'm a lesbian because of that. But uh, it's about to disobey that this pre, uh, this order of homogenized, uh, homonormative, uh, heteronormative, that it's not a practical sexual practice practices uh, it's about to make you you know obeying all the time of the system and i like to disobey and i ju just want to um, close with this I, my invitation is to make you a uh, disobedience people that uh, with gender with market with everything that you can disobey and make a uh, communities of alliance between you because it's really important right now to make it like that and I get nervous so I can just I'm gonna <laughs> finish here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Pues muchísimas gracias a, a nuestras invitadas y a todas ustedes y por estar aquí eh, con nosotros. Um, una última, un último aviso es que el Instituto Get va a estar participando con una selección cinematográfica en Queer as German Folk, que estará, se está presentando en el Get, ah, no, en el, perdón, en el Festival en la Muestra Internacional de Cine con Perspectiva de Género del 2 al 5 de agosto. Seis películas son alemanas con temática queer. Muchas gracias. Gracias.